everyone. Welcome to The Safe House, brought to you by The Safe House Initiative. I'm Jeff Edwards, co-chair of The Safe House Initiative and your host for today's podcast. We have a very exciting program for you today. Alex's guest last week, Matt Lee, walked us through the perils of uh, not considering the worst case scenarios. And then at the very end, he dropped a, a little bit of a bombshell on us and said, hey, got a surprise guest next week. Well, that surprise guest is Paul Karum. Paul, welcome to the safe house. Jeff, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me today. Why don't you uh, give our audience a little bit about your background and uh, how you uh, ended up in all this? Yeah, I'd love to, Jeff. So by way of introduction, as you mentioned, my name is Paul Carone. I lead the cybersecurity practice at SRM for the Americas Group. What that means is that I run the U.S. and South American practice on all things proactive services. So anything that's in your core consulting and advisory space, as well as all things in the incident response sector, so ransomware attacks, business email compromises, network intrusions, any sort of broader investigations also sits within that practice. Nice. So how'd you end up in this uh, world? So I think my my path to cyber is a little bit non-conventional, which, you know, doesn't probably surprise many in the in the field that have come across my background and myself mm-hmm. personally. I spent 15 years in the Army, mostly serving in the intelligence and counterterrorism operations space uh, mm-hmm. with one of my last assignments, supporting one of the agencies out on the D.C. Beltway on all things Russian oil and gas targeting. Mm-hmm. So from there, I uh, was able to meet with some pretty unique individuals and with pretty unique backgrounds that were doing everything across offensive cyber at the time, as well as other facets of targeting. And I knew that I would never be as good as those uh, that I was leading hands-on keyboard-wise doing the offensive mm-hmm. security bit, but cybersecurity as a whole really caught my attention. Mm-hmm. From there, upon exiting the Army, I was at PwC for a number of years, leading strategic mm-hmm. risk and transformation engagements for multiple uh, sets of different industry clients mostly in the Fortune 100, 200 series uh, types of clients. And um, I actually was able to go from that chapter of my life into incident response where, you know, I was able to make friends with Alex, who's on the show with us today as well, leading countless cases across the incident response landscape. You know, exciting times, right? You know, dealing with different threat actor groups, different ransomware variants and strains, and ultimately seeing how that ecosystem shaped up. And it really, you know, harnessed my attention and led me to where I'm at today, where I'm able to take the best of both worlds of my consulting and advisory experience, coupled with my incident response experience, and lead the practice that I do today at SRM. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thanks for taking time and uh, and uh, contributing to the Safe House Initiative. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, hey, Alex, this is your show, and your surprise guest is here and warmed up, ready to go for you. Surprise. I know. And firstly, Paul, thank you so much for joining today. And thank you so much for your service over your years of working in the the U.S. military. So thank you for that. Thanks, Alex. So today's episode, we're going to be talking about practice makes perfect. Are you ready when the time comes? What time comes? Hey, Paul, let's talk about some cyber incidents we've worked on in the past and why you feel as an expert in the incident response field that tabletop exercises and practicing your plan before the incident may actually help out? So I think you hit the nail on the head, Alex, said that it may help out. You know, I think that as we both can recall over the countless cases that you and I have both led, sometimes you get two schools of camp or by one set of clients and then those out there will have an amazing inter response plan that's effectively collecting dust in a corner, never exercised, never reviewed, never looked at, never really pressure tested. And of course, when the balloon goes up and, you know, as we all say, when the moment's here now and you need to figure out how you're going to overcome that crisis, it becomes this unlivable, unbreathing document that just basically dies on the vine. A lot of tribal knowledge comes into play into the forefront. And effectively, that cohesion, the structure, the broader plan, how things would work, how they should work, what are the core and critical areas of the business that should be reconstituted first, second, and and third, right? All that effectively leaves the doorway, it leaves the line of departure and sits with the leadership that's there. And as we all know, the, the greater majority of these attacks happen on holiday weekends, nights and weekends where you might not have the same robust leadership and experience that you'd like to in your, your worst day. And that plan that was developed, hopefully, with all those things in mind, just gets left behind. And then ultimately, when the dust settles, yeah. and people recompose themselves, they go back to the document and say, oh, yes, I forgot that we had this great 
guiding document that we could have leveraged and used at the time of crisis, but we just didn't get to. That's camp number one, right? Camp number two are those that do pressure tests and exercise that document, make sure that it's refined, make sure that it's livable and breathable for what they need to accomplish at that time of crisis. And it's not dependent on the most senior people being there at the time to be your all-stars in the game, but it also allows you that broader succession planning to be able to bring more junior members of the team to either relieve you after you've been working X amount of days for 18, 19 hours a day, or in your absence, you know, we all joke, but Murphy's alive and well. And, you know, sometimes your security leadership, whether you like it or not, they do take vacations as does your other executive team members and other constituents that should be part of the response process. Mm -hmm. So having it be so hyper-dependent as a single point of failure on one or two or three people, it helps shore that and de-risk that. So interesting. So as a professional in the industry, would you rather someone have practiced their plan, understand their plan, and have that muscle memory? Or does it work sometimes when you don't have that muscle memory and people are just scrambling around? So, you know, from my perspective, I would always hope that the teams out there are exercising that plan because, you know, one of the things as we all see is that you put things into writing, you anticipate things shaping out a certain way. And then as you exercise that plan in a training environment, you get to critique and refine in flight, right? If you wait to exercise a plan in a time of crisis, you couldn't have worked out all those kinks, you know, right or left of flash of oh, yeah. you. So ultimately, you know, it's it's a best intent, worst outcome kind of scenario where we mm. really do. And, you know, we really do advocate strongly for effectively there to be a couple of tests a year. Right. One of them being with just a core technical audience to exercise the technical component to the response. The other one that can be performed at the same time or even asynchronously should be for your leadership level to understand decision making criteria. What does that downtime mean from a dollars and cents perspective? What could it mean from a legal, reputational, or regulatory risk perspective, right? And then your third exercise a year, stitching all these together in a more integrated response exercise that tests all of these capabilities as you would in the real world. That's so interesting. And this is a new concept to me, Jeff, as well, where Paul just brought up three different types of tabletops that should be done. One as the technical, one as the non-technical, one as the leadership, and essentially put them all together every year and ensure all three departments are trained here. I think that's a really valuable concept, Paul, for organizations, especially the small and medium-sized businesses, to continuously not only have that plan, but to train and execute that plan in different scenarios. So thank you for providing that info there. I, I think that's very valuable. What would you say would be like the top three tabletop exercise small businesses should run for their organizations? So, you know, I think one of the key areas that we consistently see not really well buttoned down in these exercises is really having a good grasp of what your true recovery time is from everything going sideways to you reconstituting viable critical infrastructure back to run your core business operations so what we do see is a lot of the plans will say whatever step it might be here are the systems and applications and services that need to be restored but no one in that working group whether they be technical or non-technical has a pretty close to accurate view of what the actual reconstitution time is for the data for example if it needs to be downloaded from the cloud and then brought back into production environment and from production environment back to you know anything revenue generating that cycle alone perplexes 97 98 percent of the clients that we interact with in a real world environment let alone in a training environment so at least having a directional perspective of what that should take not just from what your third party vendor sold you on when they sold you that solution, but ultimately from a real world exercise perspective, what is it going to take for me to reconstitute critical services to generate core business operations again, right? That's first and foremost. The second part of that is ultimately getting into the understanding of what is the priority, right? You know, we've always said, and you know, you and I have discussed this countless times, Alex, we're helping clients, everything becomes a priority. So what really is the priority, right? So what are you really establishing to be your core priorities and why? And 
is that just in the eyes or perspective of your security team or is it truly in the eyes and perspective of the business right because at the end of the day security should always be enabling the business right and if it's detracting from and we're slowing it down in a time of crisis that should be revisited as well very interesting so how can an organization know that they are doing the right testing against their plan to ensure that plan is ready for you know as we spoke about last week the the worst case scenario so you know as i mentioned when we first started uh, you know and all my time in the military and specifically you know pre-deployment training and so forth you know commonly you'd hear the the saying sweat today so you don't bleed tomorrow right and i think that that so much rings true when you think about Sometimes you get a group of people together that want to play, you know, a bit of a check the block, check the box exercise for performing an, a tabletop exercise or for performing a leadership level crisis management exercise. It can't be like that, right? To really know how effective your plan is, you need to a, tr have trust in it, but in order to get trust in it, you need to be able to test it in a real world environment or as close to that. So if you default to only doing this in house, you're never going to get the right level of stress injected into it or the right external perspectives to bring into that if it's going great or if it's going a little bit too wrong if you will to kind of reel it back in so partnering with someone that has that external experience that will be a little bit more transparent with you is really the best way to exercise it so that way you can get more visibility into the efficacy of the plan i know we spoke about this a few weeks ago jeff on using an external product that helps you simulate an attack surface mm. scenario so yeah. that it's not your idea it's someone else's based off of real life experiences yeah yeah, yeah. and so yeah, it makes a lot of sense yeah it comes yeah. back again it's really amazing so mm. what would you see as like and i know you brought this up a little bit before but what would you see as like the biggest mistakes that people make in testing their plans so I think that, you know, sometimes you see plans become a little bit too prescriptive, right? Or a little bit too too much to read, right? Just a, a massive, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica size IRP that doesn't play well in the real world, right? So what we always say is make it digestible, make it refinable, and make it true to form versus just looking good on paper, right? So your plan can't tell you all of these grandiose things that should happen. It needs to be things that you need to happen to ensure success were possible, right? So that's, I'd say, at the forefront of making it something that's viable and something that can actually be exercised in, in, in a time of crisis. Because if not, again, all you've done is created a very expensive paperweight that you test without true business outcomes being on the back of it. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. And that paperweight, I still have one from one of my previous organizations that sits here. <laughs> and if they still have that plan, that exact same plan at 75 pages, right. I, I don't know how people thumb through that during a cyber incident. Exactly. And you know, you know, and I know you're fatigued, you know, you're already you're already days into this thing, you know, you're getting different rooms full of different and hard discussions. You know, there's external pressures, there's internal pressures. So having something that's very obtuse and not easy to work through is not ideal. You didn't look at page 73 for this to make sure that you exactly. went through this step? Come exactly. on, Jeff. <laughs> so, Jeff, do you have any questions for Paul before we, we go on to uh, the next part? You know, I have a million questions, but I'm not going to uh, do that. But uh, one thing I really <laughs> loved was, but what I did, yeah, it has nothing to do with this. It's about life in general. No. Sweat now so you don't bleed later. I love that. That's really so good. True. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for that one. Well, I'll tell you what, Paul, uh, I don't have any questions of you, but I tell you what, you're welcome back on the Safe House anytime. Uh, you're really very enlightening and uh, great information and, and very helpful. You've helped a lot of people today. So thank you so much. Anytime, Jeff. Thank you so much. And Alex, thanks so much for having me over today as well. Well, Alex. Again, great job, great guest. As I mean, all your guests, you have great relationships with. It's obvious it comes through uh, with all the the natural conversations you have with them, and uh, and sharing such good information and uh, usable information. So, with to that end, Paul, we always ask our guests, or I do, uh, on all the other podcasts that Alex isn't on, if you had one thing to offer and to suggest 
to our audience that if they could do today, what would that one thing be? Stay as close as you can to the real events that are happening around you. We come across so many clients that just want to, you know, put their head in, in the sand and just hope that they don't get hit tomorrow, today, the next day mm -hmm. with an attack. It's going yeah. to happen. It really comes down to what we discussed in this episode, which is being prepared. Yep. And uh, sweat today so you don't bleed again tomorrow. I love it. Thanks again. Hey, Alex, what's coming up? This is week nine and week 10 is coming up. So we're going to be wrapping it up. And then you and I are going to have kind of a another session after that, just kind of looking back at what we learned. But for next week, what do we have? Don't say special guest. <laughs> There's another special guest and we'll we'll have a surprise guest next <laughs> week as well. But Jeff, we're going to be talking about the final part of an incident response plan, and that is right. actually executing the plan and knowing how to execute the plan. We're going to talk about how to empower your organization, your different team players, your incident commander, on how they should be confidently working through the plan within the incident and how to enhance your team and incentivize your team. We have an incredible surprise guest next week as well. And I'm really excited to have him on the Safe House Initiative. Well, thank you, Alex. And again, thank you, Paul. And I want to thank Paul Carone for his contributions to the Safe House. We definitely appreciate it. That's our podcast for today. I'm Jeff Edwards for the Safe House Initiative. Thanks for joining us. And remember, be safe, be resilient, and be kind to each other. For more information about the Safe House Initiative, please use your mobile device to scan the QR code on the screen or send us an email at info at safehouseinitiative.org or visit us on our website, safehouseinitiative.org. We look forward to hearing from you.